the first step is not altering the equipment that you have to correct whatever bad swing mechanics you have. Why don't we reverse it and start from your body portion? You know, that's going to be staying with you consistently. Cameron Burney is a doctor of physical therapy and co-owner of Elevated PT. Elevated PT is physical therapy that breaks the traditional model and comes to you. Dr. Bernie's passion is helping to improve her patient's capacity to live their lives to the fullest, no matter their age or circumstance. She is here today to talk specifically to golfers that want to avoid injury and optimize their performance on the course. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider subscribing and telling a friend that you think could benefit from this information. Welcome to Only the Greatest Podcast. If you're feeling stuck and unsure what to do next in your fitness journey, we might be what you're looking for. My name is Philip. I own and operate OTG Fitness, which is a private personal training gym on the south side of Houston in Webster. I do this podcast every week with my best friend, Daryl. We've been friends since third grade and working out together ever since. Also joining us today will be Sean. He's the one that makes this podcast not only sound great, but look good as well. Our goal here is to help Houston make its way up the ladder of health and fitness. So if you're in the Houston area and ready to become the greatest version of yourself, be sure to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. I know you said just call you Cameron, but I I can't talk to a doctor and not call you Dr. (laughs) Bernie. I don't understand how you, how you don't prefer to be called doctor. I don't know. You know, I just, you know, when I was in school, I really was like, oh, the second I graduate, everybody's going to have to call me Dr. Chide. That was my maiden name. Okay. Um, And I told my parents, I'm like, for a whole day afterwards, you're gonna have to call me Dr. Chide. And then I got there and I was like, no, that feels weird. Just, you know, just stick with Cameron or Cam. (laughs) Mm, I don't know. I'm going to stick with with doc, how about Doctor B? Go for it. Okay, well, like, well that's like Doctor Frank. Doctor Frank's like, yeah, just call me Frank. I'm like, dude, nah, dude, dude, nah. that would be sick, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now we're gonna go with Doctor B today. Okay, okay so do. thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I'm excited. And that's something cool. that you mentioned earlier that I actually didn't initially think of, but is a really great point because maybe myself being in like fitness, I do think of um, physical therapists being there for people to elevate f- performance often. But I guess to the lay person, maybe, and someone listening to this, they do usually consider a physical therapist only getting involved like post surgeries, um, major injuries, things like that. So, do you want to go ahead and talk a little bit about the role that that you could play in someone that's even not necessarily, you know, post surgery or post major injury? Absolutely. So, um, my business partner Christina and I have kind of changed our language a little bit to help um, other people kind of understand the the vast area that we're able to cover with with our degree um, and so we're kind of going from marketing ourselves as, as elevated physical therapy more to elevated um, performance therapy or perform, performance training because you know it's obviously you know we want you to be able to perform better in your life no matter what you're doing whether it's just hanging out with your grandkids I want you to be able to perf- perform better at that but also perform better at whatever other hobbies that you have whether it's golf baseball running, whatever it may be. And when you first got into or first decided that this was going to be the career path you went, did you know that at the time that you wanted to help people be better or were you just more thinking of it as a overcoming injury situation? Um, I don't think I quite understood all of the aspects of PT at the time. Um, I have played sports for forever. I played softball for 14 years, like I mentioned earlier. And, um, and I always liked anatomy. I was always a science and math girl, but uh, I hate blood. So, you know, that, that <laughs> sure. narrowed things down a little bit. <laughs> yes. I, I don't know how anyone does it. There's no way I'm dealing with people's fluids of any kind. Yeah, yeah I so. think I think throw up would get me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no yeah. way. Can't no way. Can do it. For sure. So I think, so that obviously narrowed it down. But um, understanding the way the body moves is just really cool um, mm-hmm. and being able to break it down. So that kind of brought me into PT and I, I guess I didn't really understand all of the different aspects of it. And obviously you mentioned from the layman's terms, I understood it of like, you know, my mom had back pain and so she went to PT to help with her back pain. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of all I, all I really knew about it until I started volunteering and, and learning about the, you know, brain injury side of things and neuro rehabilitation and all of that. 
Um, but no, I, I, I guess I didn't quite understand the performance <coughs> aspect of it. Um, and I think, like, if you if you were to look at any professional sport, so, you know, we're talking about golf today, so we'll talk, we'll talk about uh, the PGA. So if you're watching, every single one of those players has a medical team. And on that medical team, at least 95% of them have physical therapists. But I feel like the layman's person might think, like, well, they're not injured, like they're playing, why do they need a physical therapist? Well, it's not just about injury. It's about how you're performing. And their their tournaments last several days, and so they need to have top performance and optimal performance for every single day of that tournament. And so they just kind of keep them into shape and make sure that things don't turn into injuries at that point. Yeah, I personally love going to any sporting event super early and watching the trainers and the therapists out there warming up the athletes, seeing what they do. Now, I don't work with professional athletes myself. Obviously, we're personal training, more for general population, helping people lose weight, feel better, stuff like that. Um, but training athletes is very fun, and I, I do enjoy seeing what they're doing with the athletes pre-game and stuff like that. It's really fun. How did you specifically get into golf? I know you, you mentioned you played softball, and I know mm -hmm. you play a little bit of golf now mm -hmm. yourself, um, but what was it? And I don't know, um, let me pre-frame with when I first met you and uh, Dr. Christina, like when I asked what y'all specialties were, golf was like kind of the, the first and foremost thing for you, like helping golfers improve uh, overcoming injuries and things like that, which we're going to talk about all that stuff today. How did that start specifically for you? Sure. So um, my parents and I would go and play around a golf, I don't know, every now and then when we, whenever we'd have a free weekend uh, in high school. But it was very rare. It was never to the point where I was hitting consistently. I was losing balls left and right. Um, so I re wouldn't really count myself as a golfer then. Um, and then in college and PT school, you know, don't have the money to be going playing golf. So um, once I got married and the pandemic hit, my husband and I started playing golf very frequently. You know, there wasn't a whole lot else to do, and it was something that we enjoyed together. And then we'd play, you know, scrambles with my parents on the weekends or something like that. And so I started playing more and more consistently, and it was a lot of fun, and it was a way for me to get out the competitive side that I have that has just kind of stayed dormant for a while, you know, because mm -hmm. I'm not in school anymore. I'm not playing sports anymore. And so, you know, what am I going to compete with? My GPS on my drive home, you know <laughs> right. what I'm saying? Yeah. So. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> that is such a competitive thing. I've never, I mean. Dude, it always feels good to shave a couple of, right? couple of minutes yeah. off. Yeah, let me get that ETA down. Yeah. Let me do that. Just a little bit. <laughs> You're like, bet. Uh -huh. That is so yeah. funny. My girlfriend and I are very competitive with each other. Yes. So I feel like maybe that's my, like, we have that. But for someone that, that doesn't, for sure, compete with that GPS. You tell that thing, Miss Boss. That's so funny. Um, yeah, I think that uh, finding ways to fill our competitive drive as adults is very important. Yeah, and for sure. Even if you're not a professional, I recommend people all the time, find a sport, find an activity, a skill that you can get better at mm -hmm. because the sense of fulfillment absolutely is, is so high when, when you get better at something. You don't have to be a professional. You don't have to be winning money, but find something that you enjoy doing. Bonus if it's outside and gets <laughs> yeah. you active, right? Yeah. And you get better at it and you build that skill set. And um, speaking of, like, the kind of the first thing that we were going to talk about today is, you know, uh, optimizing performance and avoiding things that degrade performance. You sure. Know, uh, specifically on the golf course is what we're talking about mm -hmm. today. Um, but w what kind of, what I wanted to mention was, it's important to do that in all aspects of your life. And today Absolutely. we just happen to be speaking about golf. So maybe you can get us started here with talking about some things that do, you know, degrade performance, things that you want to avoid. And um, then we can move into, you know, specific workouts and protocols. And then we'll talk about the injury stuff a little later. Sure. So um, obviously, you know, any kind of pain or injury is going to degrade performance, right? Because you start to compensate. But besides that, things like lacking mobility. So, Let's say, you know, you played baseball, so I'm going to put it in, in kind of baseball terms. So let's say that someone who's in their 30s or 40s is like, I'm going to become a, a, a pitcher just randomly. So then they go see a pitching coach. And let's say that they can't lift their arm up this high. And the pitching coach is like, okay, well, I, I need you to lift it that high. And he's like, well, well I, I can't. What is the pitching coach going to do? How Do they know how to get that shoulder to move better, to be able to lift it up higher? What is causing them to not be able to lift their arm? Is it strength? Is it joint restriction? Is it a flexibility issue? What's actually going on? Can their brain not send that signal? Is that muscle not working right? Is there a nerve issue? So the, the coach can ask you to do that over and over and over again. But if your shoulder is not letting you do it, there's no way that you can do what your coach is asking you to do. 
So the same thing goes for golf um, or really any sport. If you have limitations, even if you change your equipment, even if you go see a golf pro, your body might not allow you to do the motions that you're trying to do or that you think you might be doing or that your golf pro is trying to get you to do. You know, you can buy the most expensive equipment, but that might not help your slice if your mobility is not there to even let you rotate that way. So <clears throat> mobility is definitely a big thing. Yeah, I w- something I was going to ask <clears throat> that I thought about as you're, as you're speaking there is how many athletes, and we'll call them athletes for purposes of today, do you think are out there that are lacking this mobility and just don't even know it? Oh, I would say a significant amount. And some sports, I feel like the lack of mobility is very apparent, like the inability to raise your arm when you're trying to throw. But with golf, there's so many little things that that all have to kind of come together because it's such a rotational sport that so many things have to work together. Your hips, your ankles, your knees, your your spine, your pelvis, your shoulder, your elbow, your neck. Um, and so if there's limitations in one area, it's just going to kind of be a chain reaction and lead to issues in other areas. And so um, things might be hidden um, by the way that you've compensated over time, but mobility doesn't just get better on its own. It's something that has to be worked on. And I think that people don't always know what kind of mobility they need or where they need the mobility or which direction they need the mobility. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, people are like, oh, I stretch my hamstrings or, oh, I do this one stretch here or I, you know, twist and stretch my glutes. But, okay, what is that getting you? What part of the swing is that helping you with? Is that something that's even tight? Mm -hmm. Or is that just something that you're doing because you read that online? Yeah, can you give me maybe... Two specifics, I know you mentioned hips, ankles, and things like that. Can you give me, like, two big ones that maybe you see a lot of that someone can attack with their mobility uh, and then h- also how to do it, right? So you mean, like, what is restricted? Or? Yes. Yeah, it's like two big restrictions <clears throat> that you see. Say just your, your standard, you know, golfer comes and sees you. What are you, in your mind, somebody tells you that they want to come see you. They're not necessarily feeling any pain, like, there's probably a couple things that come to your mind that's probably wrong with them. Sure. What I would are those say, things? Okay, so this sound this might come off wrong, but um, I would say if it's a, a man that's coming to me, okay, men typically have an issue with disassociating their upper body, their trunk, their their shoulder area with their pelvis. So y'all typically will move more as a unit than women. Women are usually better able to disassociate the two and move each freely. So that's something that I'm going to assess for sure, in all my golfers, but um, for sure in men, and nine times out of ten, they have difficulty with it. And so being able to be strong and stable. So with your body, there are segments that need to be stable and segments that need to be mobile, and it kind of works as a pattern throughout the body. So if my hips are stable, my upper body needs to be mobile and vice versa. So if I'm different parts of the golf swing, golf swing. So working on that and making sure that they can disassociate the two and be strong with both movements is um, one thing that can lead to back pain and compensations with your shoulders um, because you're not able to rotate the same and things like that. Wow. That sounds like it um, applies to many things, but exactly uh, in in a golf swing for sure. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking like I played baseball, like you mentioned, and I'm thinking, yeah, if, if you want your hips doing one thing, then the rest of your body needs to be stable or the sure. vice versa, the opposite, yes. you know? So what, what's something that I could do um, if, I, if I'm a golfer and I and you say that, you're like, man, I think she's right. Maybe that's me. You know, I'm a guy. I've been playing for a while. What, what, what can I do to, to overcome that? Or is there a specific exercise that I can do? Is there some, some training, some warm-ups maybe, something like that? Sure. So one thing that I like to do um, kind of as a starter for – or trying to, to learn how to disassociate the two, is let's say that you are standing with your <clears throat> like bottom up against a, a wall, and you get into a five iron stance, like you're like you're gonna be, you know, hitting hitting a ball with the, with a five iron. Then you cross your arms, and then what you want to do is turn your shoulders and your upper body while keeping your hips square, your butt square against the wall. So you're trying to keep that stabilized while you move your upper body as far as you can and while maintaining that golf stance and that five iron stance and rotating as far as you can and working on that control and making sure that you're able to control it. You can add weight to that if you wanted to. Um, But most people have trouble with that. But the the feedback of the wall against your butt helps you to um, feel if you're starting to lift. 
Right. And do you see if people practice that over time, they can go further. Absolutely. And further. And, then, and, and that's further. kind of the introductory exercise. And then you can progress from there and you can do more rotational strengthening exercises without worrying about, am I moving as a unit like a robot or am I separating the two? Um, and then for an exercise for the opposite. So if we're trying to stabilize the hips and then move the upper body, um, what I like to do is have you stand with like holding a golf club out in front of you, like an iron and with both hands on the iron, the top of the iron and moving the hips from side to side while keeping your feet planted. So I'm still in like a golf stance, holding the iron out in front, like it's on the ground. And then I'm just kind of moving my hips without moving my shoulders. Shoulders. It's hard to kind of do sitting. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I'm following though. No, okay. I'm following. You Basically what you're doing is you're finding, you're forcing one piece of the body to be stationary, yes. whether it's the wall or the iron, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other part of the body, you're trying to move it. Yes. And now, and you're giving yourself signals. Yes. Right. You're trying to improve the neuromuscular control um, and your body's ability to differentiate the two from one another. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Those, those are uh, great tips. What about, so you get one for men, you called me out. I got this. That's fine. You know, uh, I was, I was over here moving the whole yeah, time. I'll try I saw you. <laughs> Independent, bro. I was doing, I was doing the mummy over here. Yeah. Knocking it out. Yeah, give, give us one more. Maybe if it's a female, like what's, what's something mm. that, and I, I mean, it maybe it doesn't have to necessarily be female. And I just, would say, so females, t it tends to be, I would say more, strength, um, okay. maybe coordination related. Um, for mobility purposes, I would say another good example, which is also kind of hard to do um, sitting, but so let's say I'm a right-handed golfer. So my left leg is going to be in the front, right? And so whenever I am swinging backs so on my back swing, if I'm doing it properly, then my left hip, because my foot's supposed to be staying still, right? My left hip should be going into external rotation. Because even though it's stationary, my pelvis is rotating mm -hmm. off of that axis, right? So when I'm on my backswing, my left hip is going into external rotation. Then on my downswing, my pelvis rotates. And so now my left hip is now going into internal rotation. And so if that is lacking, it's going to cause compensations with other parts of your swing. So <clears throat> hip mobility, especially internal rotation, seems to be a common issue as well. Okay. So mobility is a big one that people yes. can work on. Yes. And that's something that we see in the, in the gym all the time, sure. even with, with non-athletes, right? Yeah. So the mobility situation and, um, my understanding of mobility is strength through the entire range of motion. Absolutely. Is that how you define mobility as well? So in my mind, I think mobility meaning like, can your joint move throughout its entire range? Now mm -hmm. your muscles can't they can't work at their their best maximum capacity. Yes, their maximum capacity <clears throat> capacity without your joint moving throughout its full range of motion. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if your knees can't move past ninety degrees, like you're not going to be able to do a complete squat, no matter how many times you ask them to do that. Um, if you know things like that, so mo in my mind, mobility. I, I picture like joint mobility, but mm -hmm. to have that stay, if you no matter how much mobility work you do you will not maintain that mobility or that flexibility if you don't strengthen without the entire range of that joint's motion. So they go hand in hand. Right. Um, but I, I don't know. I feel like they, they need to be paired. Yeah, That's they do get paired. And the way that I s separate uh, flexibility from mobility is flexibility is the ability to move, to get there. Mobility is having the strength and structure throughout the whole thing. So that's kind of how they're different. You know. Yes. And I also think like in, in my mind, my PT <clears throat> mind, at least flexibility to me says my, how your muscles are moving, like your, your joint. No, that's not the right way. Uh, your, your muscle, how well it can stretch and how well it can compress yes. versus when I think mobility, I think how well your joint, the joint is included. I agree with that as, as well, well yeah. as your overall mobility in terms of like how well you can pick up something off the floor and yeah. things like that. Yeah. Flexibility mean, is the ability for your musculature yes. to yeah. be, uh -huh. to move and be flexible where mobility compress. includes the joint and as the well. strength through the thing. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Very cool. Um, is there something else outside of mobility that you think a lot of people maybe suffer from that's, um, uh, hindering their performance? Absolutely. So we mentioned the mobility, we mentioned injury and pain, we mm -hmm. mentioned uh, disassociation of the trunk and, and all of that. And that was <clears throat> my main things that I really wanted uh, to talk about there, but also nonspecific training. So let's say that you're a golfer doing things like bicep curls and squats, although those might be helpful 
that's not going to necessarily help with your golf swing. That might mm-hmm. not help hit further off the tee because golf is such a rotational sport that you have to be able to train into that rotation or else it's not going to translate. Um, so not training specifically, I think, is another thing that can degrade your golf performance. Mm-hmm. So you're recommending a, a combination of both, yes. right? Uh-huh. So you do the strength training, mm-hmm. right? You need to do that. Sure. And mm-hmm. then outside of that, you have this specific stuff that you yes. work on as well. And, you know, you can start with less specific um, to improve your overall strength and mobility, like we talked about. Mm-hmm. But um, as you progress, adding in more rotational components and things like that to be more specific to whatever task you're trying to do, whether that's golf or something else. Yeah. Can you give me some examples uh, that are, that are golf related? Yeah. Let's go into that. You know, let's, how, how do we, how do I optimize my workouts? So I have my workout, I did my strength training, I did my squats, did my deadlifts and stuff. And now I'm ready to start doing some actually golf specific workouts. So sure. let's, let's kind of so cover some of those. With, with any kind of sport that requires like a vicious quick movement, like golf does, um, you need power, you need Uh, control with rotation and strength with rotation. You have to be able to accelerate and decelerate that motion. So that includes having to do things like a concentric contraction and an eccentric contraction to be able to control that. And you have to practice that or else you're going to go out to the golf course and you're going to be hitting, you know, 100 plus balls by the time you go out to the range and everything and take practice swings. And so do you expect that to translate if you're only doing 10 of them at the gym or none at the gym? Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, that's going to change throughout your your 18 holes that you're playing. Um, Oh yeah. I'm like, what were we talking about? Uh, So we're talking about power and we were talking about rotational components. So cardio is also important. So obviously whenever you're playing for four to five hours, although you might be using a golf cart, you still have to be able to swing that many times. So there's cardio, but there's also muscular endurance. Mm, So mm -hmm. you have to kind of train for both Um, having, you know, muscle bulk is one thing, but having your muscles be able to, maintain their strength and their capacity to do what you want it to do over a length of time is something else. Um, so making sure that you train in that sense too, um, not just for like the flashy muscles, you know? Yeah. And how, how do we train uh, in your opinion? How do we train muscle endurance? Um, I would say having more reps, Mm -hmm. um, with a low load is the best way to go. Mm -hmm. Um, but like I said, making sure that whenever you are training that it's more into your task specific uh, activity that you're trying to do. Um, which, and what I mean by that is not, you know, let me tie a, a TheraBand to the bottom of my, my golf club and I'm just going to swing it <laughs> yeah, and, sure. and try to have that kind of resistance. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what I was thinking, though. Yeah, that's kind of, I <laughs> mean, you know, you yeah. might think, yeah, yes, that's, you that's would think that, thinking. but that will just kind of cause you to, to compensate with, with other things because now your, your body mechanics have changed because there's a random load at the end of your golf club that you're not used to. Mm-hmm. And so it's going to cause you to... Um, have variations in your swing and cause poor muscle memory. So it okay. would be better to do things like, um, if I am kneeling, what we call it, um, half kneeling. So I'm with one, okay. All right. Perfect. Um, and with the TheraBand, you know, tied either up high or down low and doing a chopping or a lifting motion. So those are really good because I am stabilizing my pelvis and I am rotating my trunk. So getting that rotational component. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Another way would be, like if I am doing a step up and a step up with a knee drive, right? Perfect. And yeah. so whenever I do a step up with a knee drive, if I'm also holding a medicine ball or something like that, step up with knee drive and do a rotation at the top. Okay. And then step back down. You can do it stepping it forward. You can do it stepping up laterally, either one. But adding that power in with the rotation is going to be helpful in getting your muscles prepared for that type of activity. Yeah. So if you're not familiar with uh, half kneeling, that would be where you're down on one knee, um, basically is two two ninety degree angles. Yes. Uh, down on one knee, tall yes. chest type of situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what I was going to ask. My next question was going to be, can you give me some gym specific <laughs> workouts that I can do? I actually, to be honest with you, I think I told you before we started, I have one client in particular. Uh, at our gym that is very into golf and I told him that I was going to be talking to you today and uh, he mentioned one thing that we'll cover a little bit uh, when we get to the injuries but yeah I was kind of curious you mentioned two a chopping and then a a knee drive with rotation and uh, lifting so chopping and lifting meaning coming from up high with okay. the TheraBand or mm-hmm. coming from down low with the TheraBand and okay. that would go in both directions yeah and what's what's the advantage of of the diagonal 
So golf is a diagonal and rotational movement. So you start down low, you come up high, and then you come down low again and then go back ah, up high. Duh. So coming from all different directions um, to cover all bases, essentially, mm-hmm. would be your best bet. Okay, cool. Do you have uh, w- one more exercise that, that sure. you can name that would be so really helpful? balance and coordination is also really important. Mm-hmm. So um, in different parts of your golf swing, you're putting different pressures on different aspects of your feet and on one leg versus another leg. And so making sure that you have good stability um, and with single leg is really important. Mm-hmm. So um, doing the step ups with the knee drive is going to be really good for rotation, power, strength, um, muscular endurance, but also for the single leg balance, having to stand up on that one leg. Um, so doing other kind of single leg balance exercises um, could be helpful, standing on one leg on the BOSU ball mm-hmm. and passing a weight back and forth. Or another one that I really like, which is uh, a little challenging, is if you stand on the BOSU, and put like a, a ball on the ground and then with your opposite foot, try to trace the ball and pass it all the way around your body. I don't know oh, interesting. So you're like I'm in saying. a, you're like in a pistol. No, squat I'm almost. in a, I'm in a single, I'm standing on one leg yes. and then my other leg is passing the ball all the way around. Yeah. So you're in like a, a half then, of a squat almost kind of to get, get kind your, of, yeah. I wouldn't say, my knee's not locked out, but I'm not in a total squat. Okay. Either. I'm kind of like in a soft knee. Yes. Okay. I'm, yeah. A soft knee situation. Yeah. yeah I understand. And passing that ball around. It's really hard. Wow. That sounds um, difficult. Yeah, no, so you're having tough. to, yeah, you're having to do a lot of core stability with that. Um, yeah. I think maybe start, balance. start with just on the ground. Sure. Right. Yes. Uh, on a or stable start surface. Just on the BOSU by itself mm-hmm. and maybe passing a weight with your hands. Oh, and there you go. Like that. And then work your way up to the ball. Um, another one would be if you're in a half kneeling position and you're doing like a row or something like yes. that, just to also add in a little bit more stability while you're in that position. Yeah, we do a lot of um, anti-rotation as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Anti-rotation is some stuff that I really like. Sure. Pretty much anything single-sided, unilateral, kind of yeah. has that anti-rotation yeah. aspect um, to it, right? So I think, yeah, that's really cool. Something else I want, also wanted to ask when it comes to workouts, mm-hmm. like protocol-wise, what type of volume – do you recommend and how am I integrating it with actually specifically practicing my game? So how, like what type of volume and frequency between my workouts, like in the gym where I'm kind of doing this Mm -hmm. half kneeling rotation strength stuff. And then how am I balancing that with actually practicing my game and how am I make sure that I don't overdo either one? Sure. So I think one thing that might discourage people is as we improve our strength and as we improve our mobility, it's going to change our swing because at this point we've compensated for whatever our body was doing at the time. So if you all of a sudden have more hip motion, then your trunk is going to be flying all over the place because you were having to do that to compensate for your hip. And then now your hip is able to move better. And so now you're like, wait a minute, I can't control the ball anymore because I'm, I'm all over the place. And so having, um, patience with that is really important. I think, what people end up doing, the the kind of sequence that they end up doing is they, you know, they're hitting and then they're like, oh, I'm kind of hitting off. You know, it's it's probably my driver. I probably need a new driver. Right? <laughs> yeah. and so they go out and they buy. It's like, always the equipment. Right. Yeah. They go out and they buy like a five hundred dollar driver and then they keep hitting and they're like, oh, you know, maybe that's better. It, it looks a little bit better, but I still it's still a little off, you know. So then they might go see a golf pro and they work with a golf pro and, you know, they they'll improve some. Um, but there's still something missing there. They still can't get what they're looking for, right? And then they might go seek a PT. Maybe they had an injury because they were trying to get their body to do something that it wasn't able to do. Um, But in reality, it needs to be the opposite. They need to come see a PT first, get their mobility right, then go see the golf pro because I'm not doing anything with their swing. I have no intention. That is not my wheelhouse. I'm leaving that all up to the golf pros. I'm not trying to correct your swing. I'm just trying to make it easier for you to swing. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to make it easier for you to do what the golf pro is asking you to do. So come see me, then go see the golf pro. And then they're going to be able to recommend better equipment for you. That's also not my wheelhouse. And I don't want, I will never make claims that it is. Sure. Um, but the first step is not altering the equipment that you have to correct whatever bad swing mechanics you have. Why don't we reverse it and start from your body portion? Your body's not going to be you know, that's going to be staying with you consistently. You can buy all sorts of new equipment. Yeah. That's so funny. And it's so true across the board. I used to, I used to bowl a lot and like, instead of, 
if you do something wrong, God, I need a new ball. Yep. Need a new ball. Or yeah, need a Sha- new lens. Yeah, I was <laughs> yeah, about yeah, to say yeah, with yeah. Sean, like, <laughs> yeah. man, my, these photos don't look too good. Man. Need a new camera. Yeah, time to get a new camera. <laughs> yeah, time need, to upgrade. Yeah, time to upgrade. <laughs> and uh, equipment's fun. I know. It's it is. Flashy. Oh, yeah. 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 It's yeah. fun. Yeah. It makes yeah. you feel good, you yeah. know. But it's like mo- most people stop getting Christmas presents at such a young age. So it's just like, man, every now and then it's like, Dude, I got Christmas anytime I want. Yeah. <laughs> this is <laughs> sick. <laughs> We'd always try to remind people, and this happens a lot in the gym as well. People, they, they want flashiness. They want a fancy diet, a fancy workout mm-hmm. where we really focus on the fundamentals. So what I remind everyone when they want to get flashy and fancy like this is, you know what's more fun than, than new stuff, new flashy equipment? Results. <laughs> right? Yeah. Results. 100%. <laughs> right? So do what you need to do to get results. Winning is fun. Yep. Right? Being better than I was yesterday, that's fun. And it's not always easier to do that, though. Sometimes you have to take the hard road to actually get better at something. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, anyone who's played sports knows it, that it's more fun when you're playing better right yes. like whenever you're sucking it's just the it's just not as fun for you right and especially if you're if you're playing 18 holes and you know you're the front nine or you're doing well and then the back nine you're falling apart okay well why do you think that is consistently why do you mm-hmm. think the back nine you're falling apart um if you can stay consistent throughout your whole your whole course that day of course it's going to be more fun. Of course yeah. you can have the bragging rights to your friends and you're going to you know, take all their money that day. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. And, and those are all really great points. And something I think we kind of skipped over a little bit was um, I, I was asking about the uh, how to intertwine my workouts mm, with, right. my, with my amount of time that I'm spending practicing my sport. So I have sure. exercise in the gym to help me get better at my sport. And then I also have uh, the sport itself, right? The specific things like putting, driving, driving range, things like that. You know, how do I think about combining those two? What's too much? Like, how do I make sure I'm not overdoing either one and making sure that they're blending well and meshing together? Sure. So, uh, and this might be different from me, from other therapists, I'm not sure. But for me, I don't have a specific formula protocol type thing. I go based off of what my patient or my client's telling me. Mm -hmm. So, I'm always asking detailed questions every time I see them. Okay, how did you feel after our session? Did, like, were you sore? Were you painful? Um, if you were, how long did that last? Did that go throughout the night? Was that over the next day or was it still there the next day? Um, and kind of working that way. And, you know, we listen to the body. So we say, okay, we did a workout today and you're playing tomorrow. Let's see how you feel. If you start hurting or, or whatever that might be, just stop for the day, mm-hmm. pack up, go home, see if the, the club will give you a rain check for this, the back nine. Um, but I I don't know. I'm, I'm more so like, let's just try things and see what happens. And we listen to, as long as you are going to listen to your body and not push through it. To me, that's the best way of understanding that specific person's body better. Sure. Um, than putting everybody into a box. Yeah. Cause there definitely is, um, in my opinion, there's like even a genetic component to this about how much someone can handle, Mm -hmm. right? Like people have different stress levels, right? People have different amounts of times that they're able to sleep. Um, Nutrition probably plays a big role in this this question that I'm asking you, right? And how well they recover and and things like that, right? So yeah, each person needs to learn how to listen to their body. Don't overdo it. If something doesn't feel right, then maybe back off a little bit, Mm -hmm. right? Reassess and just learn over time. Yeah, right. and at the and at, typically at the beginning, um, it'll be more exercise based and less sport based. And then, as you get stronger and you get more mobile and things are moving better, then we incorporate more and more of the sport aspect to it. And um, meaning like going out and playing mm-hmm. on the weekends and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say, you know, making sure that they know we're starting off small. We're just maybe we're gonna just chip for a little bit, and we're not gonna actually go hit the driver, you know. Or maybe we're just gonna focus on irons. We're gonna focus on fairway play, um, and just kind of working up from there. So mm-hmm. it just kind of depends on their specific um, complaint or issue. You know, are are they seeing me for just wanting to hit further off the tee, um, or have more consistent play on the fairway, or are they seeing me because they have back pain? You know, that's also something else to consider. I feel like the majority just want to hit further. I don't know if that's yeah. true or not. But. Well, and I and the, like that kind of brings us back to the what we were talking about at the beginning. People for some reason don't see physical therapy as something that they need to look into if they're just trying to hit further mm. off the tee. Okay, right? yeah, makes sense. Um, I understand. And so, 
most people that come to me for golf related things come to me for injuries. They have some sort of pain. Mm. Um, but that's a message that I want to get out there to everyone who plays any sport. You can go see a physical therapist for non medical things. It's we're not, I feel like people think physical therapy and they think surgery, they think some sort of drastic injury, but you don't have to put us in that tiny little box. Like we, we, we cover so many other things um, and we have so much more value than that. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent and not to put you in a box, but <laughs> um, I thought that that is a nice little uh, segue to where we can kind of talk about talk some about common injuries. injuries. Sure. Um, and anytime I'm speaking of injuries, I like to create two separate little boxes that you can <laughs> jump into. Um, one is preventing injury and then the other is overcoming injury. They're two different things, obviously preventing injury. I feel good and I want to stay this way. Sure. And then there is overcoming injury, right? So maybe the way that we can start this is, um, it, are there specific injuries or pains that you see a lot of in golfers? And then we can talk about overcoming them a little bit later, but I want to talk first about how to prevent these common things that you see. Sure. Um, so the most common thing I would see in a right-handed golfer is right-sided low back pain. Okay. Um, that's a, or if you're a left-handed golfer, then left-handed. Opposite, sure. Um, that is because you're going from a quick, you're going from a stretch, you're stretching that side into a quick movement towards that side, and you're kind of overdoing it, and that quick movement, um, if you don't have the strength or mobility, or if you're not controlling it, and you're just kind of flailing yourself in that direction, then that can cause injury on that side, and it's a, a quick compressive force. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the most common injury I see. Um, besides that, there's of course golfer's elbow. You can also get tennis elbow um, with with golf. And then I would say besides that, hip issues are are seem to be kind of like the third thing after that. Yeah, the hip ones for sure. I'm mm -hmm. familiar and I've I've heard that before. Uh, can I ask you what's the difference between tennis elbow and golfer's elbow? Sure. So um, tennis elbow is lateral epicondylitis. So it's on the outside of the elbow, whereas golfer's elbow is medial epicondylitis, so it's on the medial aspect of the elbow. So um, golfer's elbow is primarily the wrist flexors, and tennis elbow is primarily the wrist extensors. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And <laughs> if someone's experiencing that, because I told you I was talking to one of our clients mm -hmm. just this morning, actually, uh, and he was kind of curious, what, what can someone do, one, to overcome this golfer's elbow, mm -hmm. and then secondly, once they overcome it, how can I make sure it doesn't come back? So making sure that you stretch the area. So if it's your, for example, so if you have golfer's elbow and it's your wrist flexors, then you want to be able to stretch your wrist flexors. And what you're doing now is you're extending your hand in front yeah. of you, finger, uh, palm up, fingers down, yes. pulling uh, on the fingers. Yes, so stretching those wrist flexors. Um, and then with any kind of, any joint anywhere, um, Eccentric strength, eccentric control is the way to prevent injury um, or the best way to prevent injury. So for those who aren't familiar with eccentric control versus concentric. So if you think of a bicep curl and so you, you first bring the, the weight toward your shoulder, right? So with that, your bicep is going from a lengthened position to a shortened position. So it's easier on the muscle that way. That's the easiest way for the muscle to, to grab itself and pull. So that's a concentric motion. So eccentric is when you are trying to slowly lower that weight back down to the floor while you're doing that bicep curl. So that bicep is having to go from a shortened position to a lengthened position, but controlling it. So the muscle is having to let go, contract, let go, contract, let go, contract. And so it's much, much harder on the muscle, um, but having it be strong in that way helps to prevent injury because it's prepared for those quick movements and those quick, you know, reactions that it's having to do where it has to contract, relax, contract, mm -hmm. relax, um, and be in a stretched position while still maintaining a strong contraction. So it prepares you for, for more functional movement. Um, and that goes for any joint of the body. Um, but it's specifically helpful in things like lateral epicondylitis, medial epicondylitis, mm -hmm. Achilles tendinopathy, uh, plantar fasciitis, things that are inflammatory in nature. Yeah, it's funny because <clears throat> in the gym, you know, obviously we talk about hypertrophy, right? Mm -hmm. We're not always talking about sometimes performance for sure, but a lot uh -huh. of times it's like a hypertrophy situation. We're trying to build muscle and we always remind people that controlling the eccentric 
and getting a deep stretch under load during the eccentric is actually where results yes. come from. I feel like a lot of people at the gym, they look for, they want to do the flashy exercises that build the muscle that look good. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, I mean, I guess it depends on what your goal is. If your goal is that, then that's one thing versus if your goal is to be more functional and be able to live a, a longer life or a better life and, and be healthier and be able to do whatever kind of activity you want to do, um, then that's a different thing. You know? Yeah, they're, they're completely different. And I would say 95% of the time we're coming from that point of view, that Good. better functionality, yeah. living, uh, living a healthier, longer life, um, more fulfilling life and sure. stuff like that. So yeah, you mentioned, okay, so the eccentric we know is more important, mm-hmm. but what specifically a- am I doing to uh, like what exercises for golfer's elbows yes, is what you're talking about? exactly, okay. yes. So we talked about stretching the wrist flexors, mm-hmm. right? So then we want to do eccentric control of those wrist flexors. Okay. So I'm gonna, it's essentially like a bicep curl, but for your wrist. Okay. So I'm lifting up and then I'm slowly lowering the weight here. So I like to, to have patients do at least a five second lower. Wow. Where it takes that long to get from that flexed position mm-hmm. down to that so you, you have your arm extended, your your palm and forearm are facing up. Yes. We have a light. What if I'm a if I'm a male, you know, in my 30s or what kind of weight am I am I? I'm always recommend? starting off low. I okay. always start off, you know, it depends. I might start off at a at a two if that's what, oh, wow. if that's what okay. the patient needs. Sure. Um, but I I typically don't start more than five for if it, sure. If it's heavy, will it hurt or? Yeah, I would I okay. would rather them start with endurance of that. Because once again, it's an inflammatory mm-hmm. condition, and if they're doing an an activity like golf mm-hmm. that's causing the golfer's elbow, they need more of that repetition. They need more of that muscular endurance versus the just the you know hypertrophy of the, of the fibers. You know, sure. Yeah. So having that low load is going to be more beneficial, and it's going to help with reducing the amount of inflammation that's going on. If you start it off too heavy, then it's just going to cause more inflammation. It's going to get more irritated. And so if you start off low and build up tolerance, I like to always see how they respond to the low load first. I'm like, you know, they might say, oh, that's easy. I'm like, okay, that's okay. We're just going to, we're going to stick with that today. And then I want you to really pay attention to tonight and tomorrow and see if it feels any you know, more tense, if it feels more inflamed or if it feels better, you mm-hmm. know, and, and do those activities that might irritate it. Like, um, you know, whether it's just typing on a computer that, that might irritate it or washing their hair or something like that, or gripping, opening a jar, test it out, see how it feels. Um, and let me know when you come in next time. And that's going to change what I do, whether we increase it or whether we stick with what we got. And when you were doing your example, you kind of had your arm extended out like on the chair. Is it important for me to have some type of stabilizer here? Like, is it important for for me to have my arm extended out, my forearms on a table, my wrist is hanging off the table for that range of motion? Can I do this like hanging to my side? Does that lose the efficiency, the Um, effects or? I usually have patients do it so that they're sitting at the table Mm -hmm. and their arm is rested with like a rolled towel right here. Okay. Like that. Yeah. Their elbows on the table and then their forearms rested. Or you can do it with your wrist hanging off the table completely. Your elbow and your whole forearm is on the table, but the wrist is off. Right. Doing it there. Um, or even if you're sitting, doing it on your thigh. Okay, gotcha. Having your wrist hanging off. Like hanging your, off your knee yep, kind of right thing. Yeah, knee. like, mm-hmm. yeah, my my forearm is on my femur, mm-hmm. right, with yep. my wrist hanging off the knee. Yep, exactly. Okay, uh, sets, reps. You said five-second eccentric. How many sets? How many reps? It depends. So I'll, I'll usually start with 10, and I'll say, okay, we're just starting with 10. And let me know when you're done. So mm-hmm. then I'm watching them. And then I say, okay, how does it feel? Um, maybe I'll palpate to see if they're more ten- tender or not. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they're like, oh, no, it feels good. I'm like, okay, let's try 10 more. And okay. then and we go from there. And that's usually the number I start with is 10. And then I go up from there. And so if they tolerated that well, then, um, you know, my next time I might do, I might go up to 12 or I might go up to 15. Or maybe I'll do an increase in weight. It just kind of depends on how they mm-hmm. respond to what I'm doing at the beginning. And then I make my decision based off of that. It's all just kind of like. Depends on the situation. Yeah. 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 And when you say palpate, you're putting pressure on the area of pain. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? Yeah. I'll kind of like dig, for lack of a better way to say it, dig my thumb in to the muscle uh, and follow it through the course. So follow it through the muscle belly where it Mm -hmm. attaches um, and then down to the tendon and see if they have more tension, less tension, more tenderness, less tenderness, yeah. things like that. And is it worthwhile for me to do this on both sides or should I just focus on the side with pain? Absolutely. I would. For, so <laughs> as a physical therapist, if I was seeing you, I would probably focus on the painful side mm-hmm. unless I saw definite 
deficits on the other side that I feel like are contributing to the one side that's painful. But at home, I would tell you it would be good when you're doing this exercise at home to do both sides. Okay. Very nice. Yeah. So that, that's kind of a, a nice cover of golfer's elbow. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So let's move on to maybe the, the hip thing, which mm-hmm. is, you said, the most common, right? So um, first question, uh, how do I overcome it? Say I'm having this, this hip pain um, going on, and then what do I do to keep it from coming back? Or did sure. you say the low back was the most common? The mo- low back is the most common. Okay, let's, let's go with that way. So low back, um, what do I do to overcome it if I'm experiencing that? And then how do I keep it from coming back? So if you're having, if you're experiencing that lower back pain, what I would say is let's take it down. Let's take it back a notch. Um, if you're having the pain while you're swinging a golf club, then we're going to need to take a break from, mm. from swinging that, that specific quick motion. Um, and let's figure out why. What am I doing that's causing the tension at my lower back? Um, is it the way that I'm swinging? Um, is it a specific swing characteristic? If so, let's try to identify that and let's fix that. So that could be incorporating the golf pro in there because they're the ones who are going to know more about the swing characteristics. Um, so that would be on their end of things. Um, and I, like I said, I think it's good for, for us to work together in that sense. Um, from my side of things, I'm going to do a, a series of testing. So I'm going to test their hip range of motion. I'm going to uh, test their hip strength, their knee strength, their ankle mobility, their ankle strength, their back strength, their back mobility. I'm going to test all of that. And I'm also going to look at how they're moving functionally. And so from my perspective, I don't treat someone based off of a diagnosis. I treat someone based off of what I find in the initial evaluation. And so your hips and your back are so intertwined and closely related that if you have pain in one of those areas, I'm always going to test the other one because anytime that you have weakness in your hips, it significantly increases your risk of developing back pain. And so I hit the hips a lot, mainly your hip external rotators, um, your glute med, and you're making sure that you have power with your glute max, not just glute max strength, but having power with it is really important. Can you uh, real quick touch on the difference between strength and power? Sure. So let's say that you are, um, okay, so if I'm just stepping up on a curb, that could be more strength related versus mm-hmm. if I'm trying to hustle up a flight of stairs, that's the exact same movement that I'm doing with my legs, but I'm having to do it quickly with fast mov- movements and having to kind of propel myself up. And so that's kind of the, uh, how yeah, I Yeah, in my mind, it's the speed aspect. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's the speed aspect. So just curious if you're... Sure. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, we're talking about um, the, the low back and the hip relation. Sure. Um, and so... I would obviously look at, like I mentioned, the hips and everything. So the mobility aspect, are they able to disassociate the two from one another and work on your core stability, but also being able to stabilize and mobilize at the same time, like we talked about earlier. Okay. And is there a specific exercise that you, that you recommend um, for, for doing that? So with, my, with any of my clients, not just golf, not just golf patients, but um, – I first start to see, I have them on their back, and I see how they do with a pelvic tilt. Are you able to even move in that direction? Um, Because that's really important for daily tasks. Are you staying in an anterior pelvic tilt or posterior pelvic tilt? Can you you, you describe that? Sure. So let's say that, um, okay, you know how some people, whenever they're standing, their butt kind of pokes out Mm -hmm. and their stomach kind of falls forward. So that would be an anterior pelvic tilt. Kind of like if you're if you're a cat and your tail is like pushed up, that's mm-hmm. kind of like that motion, right? Um, a posterior pelvic tilt is tilting the opposite way, so tucking your tail underneath you, flattening your lower back, and kind of bringing your your um, your groin area up closer towards your Hip, belly button. hips forward, like glutes kind of squeezed. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the first thing I do is I see how well they're able to do that. You would be shocked as to, or at least I was, as to how many people do not have the neuromuscular control to be able to do that very simple motion of laying on your back with your knees bent and trying to flatten your back against the bed, the, mm-hmm. the bed or the floor. Um, and so from there, then, you know, if they can do that, great. Let's, we've got that down. How is the, the endurance of that? Are you able to hold that for several seconds? And can we do that for three minutes or do you fatigue after doing it three times? Um, if you can't do it, let's try to figure out how, what kind of cues can I give you to help your body understand what I'm trying to get you to do? And so that's always kind of where I start. And then I work up from there. So 
I wouldn't just go with a golfer and go straight into doing the half kneeling rotational stuff. I'm first going to break it down and I'm going to say, okay, let's look at the back by itself. And then we're going to start building up into adding in those, those more powerful movements. Perfect. And I'm assuming you, you already said the back and the hips are, are so closely mm-hmm. related, but if you have pain in your back versus pain in your hip, are those all, are those going to be the same thing? Is that going to be the same problem and just different people experience the pain in different areas or could there be actually different things going on? There could be different things going on. There's ways that we differentiate the two. Um, so a lot of times patients with pain in their like upper glute area will say that they have hip pain. Um, Mm -hmm. that is actually typically back pain that is being referred to that area. If someone tells me that they, um, have pain and they point literally to like the outside of their hip, like that bony part, it's called your greater trochanter. If they point right to that and they say, I have pain here, I'm like, okay, that's, that's part of your hip. Mm. Or if they tell me, if they make a C with their hand and they say, I hurt right here and they grab the side of their, their hip or their pelvis. Like that, more, almost more in the front than um, the back. No, kind of like grabbing the whole thing. Oh, okay. Okay. Like putting your hand on your hip. Type okay. Thing. Gotcha. Um, then that tells me that's hip. Mm-hmm. But if you're pointing to your upper glute area or your deep glute, then upper glute would be more back. Deep glute would be more of your your uh, deep hip rotators, your piriformis, your other other deep hip rotators um, that could be inflamed or or irritated. So okay, so if it is my hip now, now the question like, how do I overcome that? Like, what's going on there? Sure. So then I would test the hip mobility. What is going on? Is it a impingement? Is it a uh, like a labral issue? Is it just weakness? Um, there's a bunch of different things that I would test to see what the source of the issue is. Is it a mobility issue? And so then I can't get into the movements. And so that's putting more stress on my mm-hmm. joint. Or is it that my muscles are fatiguing? And so then when my muscles fatigue, then there's nothing else to help support my joint. And so then that's what we need to work on. So it's a hard question. Sure. Because f- for me, from a PT standpoint, I'm looking at so many different things to guide me in what direction I'm going to go in. Um, so I would say, I guess, from your standpoint or maybe the, the listeners, um, making sure that you have good hip external rotation strength. Mm-hmm. And another thing that I don't think is trained enough is hip adductors. Okay. Um, that one is also not frequently trained. Um, I feel like a lot of people do the flashy glute max exercises and don't really work on the deep muscles enough. Yeah, it's the same thing. I see that a lot uh, in in the shoulders as well, like uh, in upper body wise, um, hips are comparable to the shoulders, sure. mm-hmm. right? It's kind of the same thing, you know. We 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 want to bench press heavy, we want to overhead press heavy, but you kind of miss out on those little things, which uh, unfortunately can sometimes lead to you know overuse injuries or just something major. Even hopefully that doesn't happen, right? But um, very comparable there. Yeah, you know? the, the I can kind of go off on that topic too, but um, for shoulder injuries, most people train, you know, the anterior muscles and they totally forget about the posterior muscles. Mm-hmm. The chronically undertrained muscle groups for your shoulder are your middle trap and your lower trap. And they tend to hyper work the upper traps and then the upper traps take over and then you end up having neck pain. Um, so for anyone with shoulder pain, I would say the first route you're going to go is to really focus on middle and lower trap exercises um, instead of your chest exercises. Do you have some specifics that you like? Yeah, um, they, they sound really simple, but okay. if you're doing them correctly, then they are difficult. Um, so prone, being on your stomach, and doing a T where you're lifting up here. So no elbow bend, just straight. So you're literally like a human T, mm-hmm. uh, laying on your stomach and lifting up towards the ceiling. Um, making sure that you're not hiking the shoulders up. You want to think of drawing your shoulder blades down and back into like a V. So if you're a woman, think of bringing your shoulder blades down and together by your bra strap. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Besides that, then doing a prone Y is really good. The Y is going to help to access your your lower fibers. Um, And you can kind of play with it with palms down versus versus thumbs up. And um, a common mistake that people do with that one is they they bend their elbows and then they go into this kind of touchdown position. Um, And so making sure that your elbows are straight and you're in that Y position um, some patients have difficulty with that because they might not have the shoulder mobility. Um, so if you don't have the shoulder mobility, then that exercise is probably not for you at that point. You mm-hmm. kind of need to break it down a little bit, improve your shoulder mobility, and then go back to that. Um, and then a third one that would be good is a prone W. 
So obviously laying on your stomach, your arms are in a W position. I don't know how to explain this. I, I, I understand. Guess. Yeah, and it makes then, sense. You're, you're doing well. Okay. Yeah. And then lifting up and think of like, um, so your palms are, are down, but mm-hmm. think of when you lift up, think of t- trying to touch your, sh- your elbows behind your back together. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah, we okay. we use very similar terms in the gym. So okay. like I I'm I'm I mean I understand and uh, knowing that I explain these types of things to people all the time, <laughs> uh, I it makes sense. Good. So what you're saying is making and sense. And I I even had somebody today ask me because I had him doing the prone W, and he was like, okay, well, what about this one exercise? And he shows me, and he's sitting up while he's doing it, and although. It, he is going into a W, he's sitting up, and so it's causing overactivation of his upper traps, mm. and he's not able to target the middle and lower traps like I was trying to get him to. Mm. Um, whereas being in the prone position, completely prone, helps to turn off the upper traps because you're going, you're using them, you're not using them against gravity. Yeah, that's because gravity is no longer a factor, sure. right? Yeah. 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 Um, so just kind of a little tidbit there to not to let your clients. Um, change their positioning based off of what they think that might be helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, you really want to do it prone to get the best benefit of it. Yeah, awesome. I guess a way to vocalize it, you can be like, whoa, I don't want no problems, man. <laughs> yeah. I, don't right? want, I don't want no problems. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that hey. position that you get into when you say that, like palms, like, whoa. Whoa, yeah. hey, hey, hey. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this isn't my food. I didn't order yeah, this. Right? Whoa, <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> Sean's <laughs> always got a way of describing things, you know. <laughs> so helpful. Um, that was great. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, um, we talked about a lot of stuff today. Yeah. Um, I hope that people listening learned something. The last thing that I wanted to kind of cover was um, at Elevated PT, the way that you guys, or is there anything else that you wanted to cover, I guess, before I kind of ask you about this? No, no, okay. we're good. Okay, awesome. Um, you know, at Elevated PT, you guys do it a little bit different, right? Mm-hmm. You go to people. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's two of you. So just just quick, quick and dirty, what exactly do you guys do if someone... Listen to this. They're a golfer, right, uh, in the Houston area because you travel to people all over mm-hmm. Houston, right? Yep. So they're a golfer in the Houston area. They really vibed with some of the stuff that you said. Like, what exactly do you guys do? How does it work? Because uh, it is a much different approach that I have, have not seen before. Sure. So whenever people think that we, you know, when they think of therapy that comes to their house, they think of home health. Um, but that's not the case with us. We bring outpatient to you. So it could be anywhere that you want us to go. You could be working a corporate job and you don't have any sick time and you can't make it into the clinic, or maybe you can't even, you don't even have time for us to come to your house. Well, I can come during your lunch break. You don't even have to leave, Mm -hmm. bring your lunch that day. I'll come, we'll, we'll go into your office or into a spare, you know, boardroom or whatever. And we'll do our session there. I'm bringing my table. I'm bringing weights. I'm bringing bands. I'm bringing everything that I need with me. Um, and so you just tell me where to meet you and, and I'm there. Um, so we are, since we're able to go wherever the client wants us to go, we're able to customize everything to their environment. And so things are able to kind of carry over a little bit better. They're able to see things that they, exercises that they need to do and be able to adjust to whatever they need. And, and I can see what they have to work with and say, okay, let's do this instead versus asking someone, well, what do you have at home? And they're like, I don't know. I don't have right. anything. Like I have a, a curtain rod, you know, like whatever. Um, and so we come to you, like I said, um, we personalize everything. Our sessions are completely one-on-one. So it's just me and Christina. We're both doctors of physical therapy. Um, we don't use any physical therapy assistants. We don't use any physical therapy technicians. Um, it's your care is consistent between um, one of your therapists. So you'll get assigned to one of us, depending on where you're located and what your complaints are. We both have different areas that we are good at seeing. Um, and so we, uh, you'll only see your one therapist. And so everything is very consistent. I'll know what's going on with you the whole time. We don't have to spend the first 30 minutes trying to recap. Um, I already know what's going on. Right. Um, you're also able to contact us 24 seven, uh, text, email call. And whenever you get a response, it's from us. We don't have any front desk staff. Um, you get a response from us. You talk to us directly and we promise to respond within 24 hours. Um, so everything is very personalized. Um, it's very catered to you and your needs and what, what's going on with you. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. It's, um, I was trying to explain to Denver earlier, Denver's my girlfriend, um, kind of, you know, how you guys uh, are, are different mm-hmm. and I kind of compared it to like, it's like us, like as personal trainers, people have a, a go-to single source resource. We offer the same 24 hour service, 24 hour response via text message, uh, which is how people prefer to communicate these sure, days for yeah. the most part. And um, it, it's just a really helpful way um, in, in to allow people to get the help that they actually need. 
Well, so, yeah, um, I mean, I, you know, all of our patients, all of our clients, they they mean something to us. And mm-hmm. we're also a small business, so every little bit counts, and we want to see everybody succeed. Right. And so um, we care about your health. We care about what's going on, and so we want to hear from you. If you have a question, I always tell everyone, before I leave that session, I'm always saying, if you have any questions, please text me. Let me know. We Let's work through it. Don't just suffer throughout the weekend and say, you know, oh, I'll tell them on Monday or whatever. Like, no, tell me then, and let's try to figure out what's going on. Yeah, when um, – so funny – Funny side note, maybe last thing is when people sign up at the gym, like the way we do personal training is a little different um, as well. People are used to personal training, like they buy 10 sessions or whatever, and then just whenever they come in and they use them or whatever. But what we do it is just, it's just automatic uh, each week, depending on how many sessions they want to do. It's very easy. Um, makes sense for everyone. It's easy for us, easy for them. And what I always tell them um, after they, you know, sign for their, um, you know, terms and conditions or whatever about, you know, hurting themselves and not being able to sue me and take my stuff, stuff like that, right? All, all that fun stuff. Yeah, yeah all that fun stuff. <laughs> I, I tell them, hey, you just gave me your credit card to put on file and I'm going to bill you because you said I could. <laughs> take advantage of that. Don't go home wondering what to do. Don't think, ah, what should I have for dinner? Or how do I meal prep? Or sh- should I stretch after my workout? Don't wonder, ask. Yeah, don't go to Google. Yeah, I can't help you if I don't know what you're thinking. (laughs) Exactly. Speak up. We are here to help you. Don't feel bad. I always tell people that communication is the most important thing because if you don't tell me during an exercise that something is too easy, something's too hard, or you're feeling something in a different spot, or you're not feeling it where you should be, or whatever, like you have to tell me because. I don't know. I can't feel what you're feeling. And so I never want you to, f- to leave a session and feel like it was a waste of your time. Right. Like you have to tell me or else I'm not going to know. Yeah. I mean, I'll do my best to observe and, and make, Absolutely, but, but, but what's going on in your mind, I, I can't read your mind. Yes, exactly. You know, so okay. Awesome. Well, if someone wanted to get a hold of you or Dr. Christina, how would they do so? Um, so check us out on social media. So our handle is Elevated PT Wellness. We have Facebook, Instagram, um, we just started a TikTok and we just started YouTube as well. So you can check us out on there. We have our website, which is elevatedptwellness.com. Um, you could email us at elevatedptwellness <laughs> at gmail.com mm-hmm. um, or you can give us a call. Okay, awesome. And you guys travel, do you have limitations to to your uh, areas that, that you travel to or is it just Houston area, you're good to go? So um, we typically see our main area, I guess, is from Beltway down to Galveston mm-hmm. and then Kima over towards uh, Pearland. Okay. But we will see outside of that. Mm-hmm. We will see up into Houston and everything. Um, depending on the mileage, we might add just like a gas fee. Okay. Um, but that's it. Okay. Awesome. Well, guys, if you need to get a hold of Dr. B yeah. <laughs> for anything, <laughs> uh, be sure to hit her up yeah. and uh, make sure you like, subscribe. Follow the show, leave a review. I hope that you love it. Share it with a friend uh, because it's very valuable information that Dr. B just brought us today. (laughs) And uh, we just want to spread the word and continue to help Houston make its way up the ladder of health and fitness. Definitely. See y'all next time. Bye. Peace out.